All right, kids, here we are. Here I am, and there you are. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna do a start to finish, meaning we're going to do the oil cooler, uh, installing the Dorman Fancy oil cooler, start to finish, and now you'll know. Now you don't gotta ask me. That's the whole point of these videos. Not the whole point of these videos, but a large point of these videos is so I don't have to retype the same information over and over again. It's nice to have it in a video form for both of us, don't you think? Because uh, there's a lot more of you than there are me. All right, what do we got here? We have a ProMaster, but I figure you saw that coming. Um, the general overview of this is that the oil cooler is the thing that lives in the V of the engine, and it is really more of an oil warmer. It keeps the oil at the same temperature as the coolant. The idea is to keep the oil temperature consistent, which keeps the oil viscosity consistent, which allows the engine to run its cam timing on consistent viscosity oil. That's really the basic idea. I suppose it cools too, to a lesser extent, but it, it really doesn't because it lives in the V of the engine. If it, cool, if it was there to make it colder, it wouldn't live in the V of the engine. The problem is since 2011, these oil coolers, while quite durable, they leak. And they leak um, for a long time. People thought that the oil cooler housing cracked. Um, you know what, I'll show it to you, stand by. All right, I'm back. Oh, son of a bitch. It's leaking oil everywhere. Okay, well, I'm back. All right, so uh, this is the oil cooler in question, and they've looked pretty much the same, more or less, since 2011, and they even look the same on the newest ones. I think it's pretty, pretty sure it's the same part on the 22 and up engines. Much, uh, but the point is that this uh, has passages on the bottom of it that mate to the top of the cylinder head, or cylinder block rather, and two are for oil and two are for coolant, and uh, I don't know what that third one's for. It does what it does. In the back of it, uh, and this is a little heat exchanger portion. For years it was thought that something cracked internally or that the case itself cracked, and people thought that putting too much force, getting this way too tight cap on and off, because your oil filter lives in here, uh, was what made this thing crack. That is not what happened. Um, at some point in the last few years, Chrysler stopped paying their dealerships to replace this. This part is 150 bucks or whatever, um, because Chrysler determined that what actually goes bad is the seals underneath. And I buy that because they were needlessly paying for thousands upon thousands of these that unscrupulous dealers would charge their customers a $1,000 um, and when it's warranty, Chrysler has to pay that. Not that they have to pay a thousand, but you get the idea. Um, the job itself books at three hours. I can do it in three hours, I think. And um, so these are actually, they're okay. But the problem is that it's plastic made it to aluminum and they expand at different rates and the seals go bad. Around 2020 or maybe 2021, Chrysler rele released a revised seal kit. The five little seals that go in the bottom, it, the part number ends in AB. Perhaps I'll be clever enough to put it on your screen. Uh, and and uh, simply upgrading that usually fixes it. But as you'll see later, we have the fancy Dorman thing. Dor because this problem is so prevalent, in fact, it's universal, pretty much every Pentastar will do this eventually. Um, Chrysler released a revised, or I'm sorry, Dorman tooled up and made this fancy billet aluminum made in the USA thing that works much better and I'm very happy with. Have yet to have one of those go bad. I should add at this point in the video, that there's an entire industry of Chinese counterfeits of the Dorman cooler. You'll go on Amazon and it'll be Dorman's picture and Dorman's text, and it'll have Dorman's part number that ends in 959, and it'll be a counterfeit. We installed four of those. Two of them were bad right out of the box and leaked, and I had to do the job twice. I'm done with that. There will be no Chinese counterfeit Dorman oil filter. Oil filter housing is what this is called or oil cooler assembly or some variation. Anyway, the rest of it is, has two sensors in the back. One's for oil temperature and one's for oil pressure. I believe I have it right. That's the lower one is pressure and the upper one is temperature. The temperature one never goes bad. The lower one goes bad constantly and it will result in a P5, a P0520 code um, oil pressure sensor fault. It is pretty much always this. Now the engine has another way to know its oil pressure. It derives its oil pressure from the cam timing. It knows the oil temperature, it knows that it has oil, and it knows where the cams are, and it determines how much pressure it would take uh, for the cams to be in those positions. That's pretty foolproof. So it's not like the engine doesn't know it has oil pressure when you get the P0520. 520, you can ignore it for hundreds of thousands, you can ignore it forever, it won't affect a damn thing except the light will be on. Um, 
I may correct myself. I'm pretty sure that's 520 and that's the temperature. Uh, and there you go. It has coolant enters it from here and probably exits it from the bottom and then oil goes through. I don't actually know the path of what this takes, but I do know in here, you'll see there's two seals and one side's oil and one side's coolant. That's a little heat exchanger and there you go. We are gonna be replacing this existent one which is stock with the Dorman unit because it's leaking. I like the Dorman because I think it will, I don't know if I could say that it would eliminate the oil cooler leak, but it would definitely lessen it or lessen its chances of happening or otherwise rule it out. And it's a very nice piece and it's, uh, it's expensive, but it's worth doing. Um, you'll find it for somewhere between 250 and 300 bucks, depending on how you look around. All right, where are we at now? Now let's take a look at the symptoms of this thing. Because we're doing start to finish, bitches. I don't care how long it takes. Okay, now I am behind the camera. I'm behind you. Oh, I'm directly behind you. All right, here's your engine in your van. Anyway, the symptom is pretty, pretty unmistakable. Uh, let's see if we can zoom in here. That is the top of your bell housing. The bell housing of your transmission. The important reference point is that white sticker. And you see how it's all... I hope you can see with the light situation. Someday I'll get good at this. Look, what do you want? They're free videos. You want production values? The hell with that. Anyway, there's the top of your bell housing. Oil all over it. It'll usually make its way to that area, which is the top of the transmission. And you can see it's made its way to the steering rack. When this goes, it will gush pretty suddenly. It will leak out the entire tank of oil in your van, maybe 50, 60 miles, maybe less, depending. You'll find oil on your rear door because it goes all the way underneath and gets curled up by the wind on the rear door. But the main place to look is just at that white sticker, which is on the center top of your bell housing. And, and you'll see, it'll be obvious. Where is it coming from? She's coming from the valley of the engine there. You'll be able to look down the barrel, the side of the oil filter area there and see down into the valley and see the pool of oil in the valley. It's almost biblical, kind of a good place to take a vacation. That is what's going on there. Uh, what's the rest of it to know? When it gets low enough, when the oil gets to about a quart, a quart and a half in the system, it will fire the a red a picture of an oil can on the dash as a low oil pressure warning light. And of course, it'll have in store a code for that. Um, hopefully you notice that because in theory, you could just keep driving and totally run out of oil. In theory, your engine, once that oil light is on, it has about a quart and a half in it. Uh, in theory, it could leak it all out. You'd have no oil and the motor would overheat, grenade, seize, everything bad, biblical, cats and dogs living together, brimstone, all of it. But in practice, what I believe, I'm not certain of this because I have no way to test it without blowing up people's vans, is that once the oil pressure got low enough, the cam timing would be so erratic, because as I mentioned, it runs on oil pressure, that the engine would basically stop running or at least you'd notice it or something. Um, and and the, the last amount of oil... Um, uh, it, it, hopefully it would stop running before it deprives the bearings of oil, which is really what we're after. It won't be making much power, that's for sure. It'll be running around quite confused. I don't know that for sure, um, but uh, it, it stands to reason because the last time I did this job, dude would drive, I mean, he had no choice. He would drive it until the light came on and then put oil back in it. And it did, uh, it did not do any lasting damage, so there you go. All right, is there anything else to know about this before I start doing the job? I guess not. I guess the overview is the, the block diagram of what we're going to be doing. We're going to take the coolant out of it so that when I take the oil cooler off, coolant doesn't pour everywhere and, more importantly, go into the oil passages and get into the oil. Um, you'll see what I do with the coolant. I'm going to take the coolant out of it. We're going to take the upper intake off. We're going to take the lower intake off. We're going to take the oil cooler out. We're going to put the new one in. We're going to reverse the process. We're going to put the coolant back in it. And uh, while I'm in there, I'm going to clean up the old oil, not because it does any damage or it smokes or anything like that, only because I want to be able to know that it's not leaking after the job. Uh, I'll show you what I mean as we go. All right, this is going to take me all day because i got to stop and talk to you pricks. Ah, here we go. Okay. This is my new thing. I call it a piece of carpet. It's better than, better than a creeper. I tend to run over my hair with a creeper. What I'm doing here is uh, I'm gonna be taking the splash shield off so I can get to the uh, radiator hoses that I'll show you in a minute. And that will allow me to take the coolant out. As I say, you can do this without a jack if you really want to. If 
you're narrow of girth. My poor name is Girth Brooks, not for the reasons you think. All right, check this out, kids. Super handy. Menard, super, super handy. Oh, I can even show you what it is. It's a big, it's just a tray for clothes and, and such, although I use them for the cats at home. They poop in them. It's a uh, Menards, 14 bucks, comes with a lid, but it makes a very nice cool and catch device, which is a good thing. Well, it turns out all my bullshit about jacking it up was for naught because the shield is off of it. The shield is normally a plastic piece that goes here. You'll find basically one, two, three, eight millimeter bolts plus one in the wheel well, and it'll drop off. It's, it has a big bolt that holds it on in the back, so it's not complicated. You people can figure it out. But what I'm gonna be doing, if I can, is taking the coolant out from here. Now, you can take the coolant out from wherever the hell you want. Not my business, but I take it out from here because this is nearly the lowest point in the system. And because we're only doing, uh, we're only trying to get the level of the coolant to, um, to be below the level of the oil cooler, we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to take it all out. Hey, nice new air conditioning compressor. Um, as soon as I dump this, I'm gonna put the hose back on because then I don't have to come down here again. Here's where I get the face full. What will speed this up will be this. Fat man rising all day, every day, up and down. If I take the cap off, this will come out a lot quicker for science reasons. You know, science and such. How are we doing down here? We're getting it all in? For the most part. All right, I won't film this next part, but once that's mostly out or all out, by the way, make sure your tray is clean before you start. Um, I'm gonna put the hose back, cinch up the clamp, and if I had the shield on here, I'd put the shield back, because I'm not gonna need to go down here. When we're all done, we're just gonna add this same uh, coolant back in from the top. Hold on, now I've done this a bazillion times. So I'm gonna do it by not taking this out and not taking this out. What I'm gonna take out is the fresh air intake, this tube, the plastic part of the intake, I am. I may move this bottle out of the way. I may unbolt it just so I can move it around for reasons that will become clear later, but I am gonna leave this in. What it does is it means when the intake comes out and goes back in, it has to do this, this Millennium Falcon thing where it rotates and it comes out in a special way and it rotates and goes back in. You'll see, but we're gonna go through it together. There's only two. What I'm taking out is this elbow piece. Um, and uh, this is, what I'm doing is I'm doing the least way, the least amount of work possible. Fucking socket. God damn it, did it go in the coolant? It did go in the coolant. Ow. Oh, boy, am I glad I left that coolant there. Now my hands are all slippery. God damn. By the way, Harbor Freight, magnetic tool tray, you won't lose your, you won't lose your nuts. By the way, recently, now I did get this, look at that. The whole set of screwdrivers that has a chisel, because you're supposed to do that, and also a, uh, a way to drive them from the back. There's a few things in here that are tricky to get to. This screw is not one of them. This has not been off in a while. This van, by the way, I suppose you should know, 528,000 miles. Uh, original engine, replaced transmission, many issues along the way. By the way, another super handy tool, stubby screwdriver, that's both. It's both. This is the hose clamp on this piece, which is your the rest of your intake hose. It goes into the side of the air box here. And when I work on something, I leave it in such a position that I can get to it easily the next time. Right in the fucking coolant. God damn, son of a... The only reason I'm leaving that under there is I know I'm gonna step in it like a like an idiot. There's nothing better than stepping in coolant. Okay. Sorry you had to see that kind of violence. Now we're gonna go fast. Because now I'm pissed. Well, I was pissed before, but how are we doing? All right. We're gonna take out the air box as soon as this comes out. It means this comes out. I should be showing you what I'm doing. If it's called start to finish, it should include start to finish, and it will. Okay, what I'm doing now is this piece 
There's another hose clamp here, which is pretty easy to get to with a stubby or a wrench from the side. Oh. I see one, two, three, four, five things on this wiring that lives at the, or this bundle of, of shite that lives on the top of the engine. Here's how you do it. This is a little vacuum thing for, it's a valve cover breather. It just comes out. The way that comes out is you squeeze and it makes it bigger and it releases. It's not too tough. The next thing I'm gonna take off is this. It's a little nub. It's a little nub that goes into the intake track just before the throttle body, and it is the intake air temperature sensor. Squeeze and pull, and it comes right out. Pretty straightforward. The next thing, I'm gonna leave this one on. This is your small EVAP pump. It's a little solenoid pump. The next thing is the only difficult one. This is the throttle body connector. This is the throttle. This is the motor that controls the butterfly. This is the wiring to it. It's a two-stage lock. Push it back, put that down, squeeze and pull rearward. You may need to squeeze and put a, uh, a screwdriver here and push. I can't do that because I am suffering for you to try and do this one-handed, but I got it. Five or six wires, all right, okay. Whole assembly just slides onto a little tang there, right? And this is a little vacuum line to it, which should just be hand releasable. And then there's also, when I start getting this wiring out of the way, I don't know if you can see, this wiring bundle that goes to the throttle has a little clip that grabs into a little thing here. You can pry if you need to, but you just pull up. It's a little V clip that goes onto a little shaped piece of the intake, which is your manifold absolute pressure or MAP sensor again. Chrysler Fun, two-stage lock. And this one, these two aren't difficult. There will be other two-stage locks in this job that are gonna be annoying as hell, but these aren't them. I might be able to... I got, I burned up all my fingernails snorting cocaine off of them. That was a joke, by the way. I don't do cocaine, I just like how it smells. to do this whole job one-handed suffer for my art come on there we go two stage lock action squeeze and pull not difficult if you put your hand on it correctly. There we go. All right, now. All right, as you can see, this now is off. And this is here, and I had previously loosened that up because it's pointed right at the top where you can get something on it. This is just gonna come out. Now this is quite a finagle, and I don't really know how to describe to you how to do this, except that it, it backs out into this corner somehow, clears the rubber piece somehow. So I thought it has to come out this way. All right, I hope that I showed that. By the way, in your intake tract, a little oil is normal. That's PCV stuff. There's your intake air temperature sensor. And you can yodel into that if you want. There is a PCV hose. The primary PCV hose is a hose that runs from here back to the PCV valve on the valve cover. And it helps if you, you can actually see there's a little arrow there. You can see what's going on there. Okay, well, there's a hose that goes here, and you can see it goes into the rear of the thing, and it's the brake, it's a brake booster. Its connector is here. <clears throat> it goes to the firewall below the, below the round brake booster, and it is simply squeezed to and pull. <sighs> there, like that. That's going to stay connected. It's, it's a little bit brittle and delicate, but it's going to stay connected. And when you go to put it back on, you just push it on and it clicks. Um, it's going to stay connected to the intake manifold. All right, and now we're going to have the fun part. Okay, now we're going to tackle the hard part. The hard part is the intake manifold. As you can see, are these in good shape? Oh, boy, I hope so. Yes, because I can't remember if I've ever been here. Hope so. These two bolt wells 
This intake manifold has seven bolts. Uh, one, two, three across the back, one, two, three across the front. But two of them are in these wells here. That well and that well. We've talked, I have videos on this. You know what, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna assume that you're, you've just watched all my videos with rapt attention. But let's see about getting that out. That's the, that's the next big important thing. All right, kiddies, here's where it gets really difficult. Here's where you need me. That's not so bad. That is your upper intake manifold. And we are going to try to get these bolts out. What you'll need is an eight uh, quarter inch, as thin as you can get, because it's got to go in these little wells. I could actually get away with a shorter extension. Okay, I am on the bolt. If this bolt doesn't turn or rounds, you are done, and you're going to be watching more of my videos to get it out. It's quite difficult. This one looks like it's going to go. Oh, that felt good. I'm going to need a cigarette. I, oh, yeah, it came right out. I'm going to be replacing these two bolts with brand new ones. Just, and then I'm going to be um, jizzing in there to make sure the water doesn't come out or to get in. I should also point out that this, these two bolts, a huge problem on this engine, not a, only a problem on the ProMaster. All the other p cars and trucks that have this have a shield on, you know, an uh, engine cover that directs the water away from this problem. And the 22 and 23 and up, all of them use the G3 Pentastar, which doesn't have this problem because they've redesigned that. I mean, this is not hard. You'll see these bolts in any diagram. And when I get the thing off, you'll see where they are. There's nothing to know here. I don't know why I didn't think to illustrate this on this engine, which is sitting right here. Um, what I was doing was facing it this way. And I was getting these two bolts out of the wells. Then there's three on the inside and three on the outside. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six, and uh, and like so. Now what we're doing is the hardest part of this whole job, which is the triangle bracket. This is a bracket that sits here, sits here. It has one bolt that holds it to the head, right there. God damn it! Ow! It has one bolt that holds it to the head, and um, in the Penistar's case, in the ProMaster's case, there's another little forked thing that goes over top of that 13 millimeter bolt right here. I brought it to show you. But anyway, once this is sitting in position, these two holes here and there on the back, God damn son of a, grab the back of the intake manifold like that and there's a 10 millimeter nut on each one. That is what we're gonna tackle. I guess it's as good as anything else to show you that on the front side, because all the Pentastars are the same in the front here. Uh, you see, God, this is difficult. These metal pieces, unfortunately, they're somewhat obscured in the ProMaster, but easy to see here. This is how the manifold locates itself like that. Again, two 10 millimeter nuts. These are accessible without having to take the, the lower brackets loose, although it may present problems, but I'll show you. Very difficult to see, but your triangle bracket is there the triangle bracket, see that rusty stud right there? I can't even focus the camera with one hand, nothing works. Focus there, do that. Fuck. There it is, oh, there it was. There it was, now it's, there it is. That is your triangle bracket, very difficult to get to. You may have to take the bottle out, I, you may be able to get your right hand around it. Depends on who you are and your skills. I see it. See that little white dot in the center? That is the other side of the front bracket there that I just showed you. And there's another one buried under there. The, the two nuts for the upper triangle bracket. Okay, and now the moment of truth. We'll see if the old man is really is as good as he says. Uh, so far, so good. I'm trying to, sh I'm trying to, sh to, to do this such a way that you can see what's going on, but I may fail. About there, that's not bad. Okay, so the intake is loose and it's off. And what it's gonna do, you're gonna have to grab that brake booster I, I mentioned and follow this all around. As it comes forward like this, it's going to come up and I, I believe I'm gonna try and clear it there. I see right now, I'm already catching on the dipstick. I suppose I could muscle that tube if I need to, but I shouldn't need to. This will come up. I'm gonna 
it's going to it's going to be a finagle but you can either get it to clear this way or if it fights you like it's fighting me literally that much clearance hopefully you can see that i am recording right yes all right that's important to here and then the Millennium Falcon comes out. Okay, one of the blue intake gaskets was left behind and raptured. Um, this is the top of your intake. We're what you're I'm sorry, this is the, you're looking at the lower intake. What I took out was the upper intake. The overview of what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be taking all the electrical out of the way and, and winding it over to the side. The electrical includes, includes the wiring to the coils and the wiring to the fuel injectors. And we are going to do a couple other things, but then we're going to loosen the lower intake and, and remove it entirely. And that will expose the cooler below it, which we'll then remove and replace. All right, how can I shoot this? Uh, I'll think of something. Mostly, that's all you'll need. So there's usually it's just a squeeze and pull on the coils. That was easy. Okay, kids, this is going to be much more useful to show it to you like this because, you know, you get the thing. Anyway, we're here on the backside, but they're both basically a mirror image. You'll see this, which is called a Christmas tree. It, uh, as you can see what it does, it's a zip tie that clips the wiring harness into a little hole. Uh, and I use a tool like this to get it out, but you can pry at it with a screwdriver. Or you could just yank on it, or you could cut it. It doesn't, it isn't really strictly necessary. This is the old coil wire. These coils have, are virgin, so they do have the two-stage lock. You can see that there's a, a pad for your finger. You pull it back, and then you squeeze, and off it comes. But, however, the fuel injector is one of the harder parts of this. All right, what you do is you get under the red locking tab, and I'm prying it up. Pops up, and then... A wheeze and pull. There we go. Anyway, with the tab pro, it squeeze and pull straight up. What'll happen though, on yours, I make it look easy because this is a low miles engine. It's going to be crusty and it's going to want to break, uh, which is okay. It can still be gotten off even when it's broken. What you might do, which I have found, is I'm, I'm getting in the seam of it with this pick and I drive the pick in just so I can get some motion started in it to give it the, the faintest suggestion that it should come up. And you can get in there because you're not gonna have a, a flat screwdriver sized thing at that sh in, in that shape and in that position. There are other videos on this, but it can be done with the pick as you just saw. Okay, here I'm gonna give you a detail of what the fuel fitting looks like. Um, it's very simple. Uh, but very difficult to show, going to be difficult to show you in the van, and, and it's a pain. So as it's sitting in the van, it has this first stage lock. You just pull this up. It's so simple, a child could do it. Oh, it was up. That's why. That's what it normally does. It locks down anyway. First stage, it pulls up. I have a special tool for this, which squeezes it, and that will allow it to release. But... It ain't pretty, and it is not pretty to do in there. This happened. I cut one off just for demonstration purposes or in case I ever need another one. I'm going to try and show you how to do it in the van. Okay, there it is in position in the van. If, <laughs> is the fuel fitting on this U-shaped piece, which is called the fuel rail, and it has to come out. The very first thing to do is to get a rag under it because it does have pressurized fuel, and sometimes they piss quite a bit. This van hasn't been run overnight. It's been in here all night, so maybe we'll get lucky. The first part is easy. You can literally do it with your hands. I don't know if you're not a moron. Like that. And what I will do often is this. This would also be the way to do it, but you can see what goes on there. That's pretty straightforward. The problem is you need three hands to do this. You need and tiny fingers. You need to squeeze on the green part on the top and the bottom and pull it out at the same time, which you cannot do, whether or not the rag is underneath it. I'm going to try and do it with my tool. I, I hope I can film it. I, you know, I won't be able to do it with one hand. I guess I can't film it. But anyway, this tool 
you can see how this is shaped and it's designed to get in there and squeeze and then I can pull it back. I also have another tool, which was an earlier attempt, which you can get around the sides of it and squeeze it like that. There's a couple ways to do it. You could also, like I say, you do it with your fingers, but you need three hands. I will not be able to show you. There's just no way. Sorry, kids. All right, kitties. I'm losing my patience with showing you this because there are better videos of it on uh, on the YouTubes. And I guess at this point, it's it's none of it is ProMaster specific. It's generic to any front wheel drive Chrysler with a Pentastar. So I don't know. Uh, if I come across things that are ProMaster specific, I'm going to show you. I guess that doesn't really fit with the whole start to finish idea. We'll see. But I'm not going to stop. Look, you're going to take the lower intake off. You take the uh, here, 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 there, 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 and there. I mean, come on. Do you really need me to show you that? These bolts do not present a problem because they are protected by the intake above it and they don't get water, generally speaking. All right, I'll be back. Okay, a couple of ProMaster specific things here. This little metal piece, uh, see with the hole in it that, you may have to bend that a little bit. It's a piece of bracketry. Uh, and that's about it. You, once you, I should have shown you, once you have the, get the upper off, you probably should put a rag in the top of these holes and then blow compressed air in there. Cause see all that shit, that shit wants to fall in the cylinder when it comes out. Um, I, I just put the rag in and then blow it out, put it directly into the cylinder head, whatever. Anyway, this is the piece you're rewarded with. And this is the lower intake with all the injectors off and the fuel connector off. As I flip this over, spilling, I'm sure spilling fuel cause the fuel is gonna come out from there. Uh, you can see that this has been on for quite a while. Look how flat these, why is it doing that? Why is it nothing work? Um, there we go. You can see how flat the gaskets are. Those have been on for a long time. Now this amount of carbon in the runners is okay. It's fine. And I know this van runs fine. So I'm not worried about injector nozzles or anything weird like that. Everything's fine. Uh, we're going to be replacing those gaskets. We're going to be cleaning up that surface and, uh, but, uh, and then, and, and before we do that, of course, we're going to extract the cooler and clean out the valley and all that fun stuff. Okay, back to some ProMaster specific stuff. I've skipped some steps here. Damn it. Um, take it off the, the top one, squeeze and pull. Bottom one seems tricky, but squeeze and pull. You can see it's a single stage. See that? Squeeze, squeeze, and pull. And the problem would be this the coolant hose. The coolant hose is attached to the block there with a zip tie, sort of a Christmas tree. You'll have to pry that out. And uh, and you don't need to replace that when you go back in. It ain't going anywhere. But the problem in this particular one, they're all a little bit different, is, oh, for God's sake, this is really difficult and very frustrating. Um, you see that constant tension clamp that's going the hose onto the end of the thing? The other end of it's buried under there. So Rather than dick around with it, I'm gonna peel up the cooler and then I'll take that off once it's up in the air. Then it'll be easy. Um, this this is held in by one, two, three, four, five of these little bolts. These guys are E8s. E is the designation for Torx, T-O-R-X. E8, hopefully that can be seen. And it's a little sort of an inverted thingy. You would need that. You would not be able to do that with uh, with anything else that you might have in your toolbox. All right, I've removed the cooler. I've uh, cleaned up the uh, intake ports, more or less. God damn it. I uh, have my fancy new little clamps holding that, that constant tension clamp on. I wanted to show you this. So. Because yours has been leaking, it's, it's all filled up in the valley. I'm gonna suck it out. We have a suction tool that we use that I'm gonna get all that out as good as I can, but you won't have that, so you're just gonna put a bunch of Tampax in there. No, you'll, you'll use paper towels or whatever. It doesn't, you don't, I technically don't have to take any of that out, but I'm gonna. Okay, kitties, this is how your kit comes from Dorman. I'll spare you the thing you read the instructions, comes with a filter, but you do need to transfer your two sensors over from the old one just sitting there. 
and they give you <clears throat> instructions, and there's a torque spec. But you can see the basic gist of how this thing works. There's the cooler section. It has an in and an out, two separate circuits. There's a get, uh, O-ring things that go there, and uh, I'll spare you. Okay, there's your beautiful Dorman 959, pretty much assembled. I'm uh, about to torque these down. The cooler, there's the, the two little gaskets are under it. That's a T30, 106 inch pounds. This is the old oil temperature sensor, never goes bad. New oil pressure sensor. The Dorman does not come with these two sensors. You can pull them off your old one, but <clears throat> this one flakes out all the time. And I figured I'd put a new one on. It'll flake out anyway. And that's your P0520. Okay, here we are screwing down the new housing. I did not show it to you because uh, there, would, there was no way to... Um, I need both hands. But uh, it kind of goes in, and the, the, what goes in first is the post with the O-ring on it, which is the important part over on this side. It goes in and it guides it down. It, it, there's, you can't get it wrong. Uh, Chrysler factory service litter, same 106 inch pounds as the cooler pieces, and you can see there's a torque sequence. One, two, three, four, five. I just take them halfway up and or get them snug, and then, you know, there you go. By the way, uh, almost every torque wrench you're going to find uh, is either this type, which reads in inch pounds, all the bigger ones read in foot pounds, as you would expect. But what counts <clears throat> is that you can get away with this for very cheap, which I did for years. You, you can see that the scale only goes up to uh, 80 inch pounds, but there you go. You can see the scale reads up to 80. If you get the pointer, say, you know, here, it'd be about 110. You can guess at it because it doesn't know any better. And that's your tip. Okay, our look. Oh, for God's sake. Our lower's back on. I'm about to uh, torque her up. Um, you can find this chart in a variety of places, but it's telling you what's going on. 106 inch pounds. Okay, here's a pretty good shot of the triangle bracket as it sits in the van. It sits there and it grabs those two things, but you can see that there's wiring to it. And you can see, see that hole there? That hole? That hole, the rusty hole. You can see where that lines up on this little pedestal there. You figure it out, but that's where it goes. And I have found that I can get to it without taking the bottle by coming around from the right with a series of extensions and shit. It sucks, but it, it can be done. All right, here's where it gets fun. Our intake's going back on. I've cleaned off the bottom. The gaskets are in there. Everything's torqued. As you can see, I don't know if I showed you, but the intake bolts can kind of, normally they go through, but you can kind of set them in the top so that they're out of your way. They're, um, i got to replace that one. They're not protruding down like this, which is going to hang you up as you go in. Now, if you recall how this went in or came out, I think it goes in in a similar fashion. I don't know. I relearn this every time I do it. Look, what can I tell you? I'm not as smart as I look. But you can see the Millennium Falcon there is going in. Something like that. And then once it's in, it can turn. And I'm paying attention to that brake booster line in the back so that I don't crush it. Not crush it in the way the young people say it. I mean, actually crush it. Once I got it in here like this, I'm going to glance and make sure that all six of my fancy intake gaskets are in. Because that would, that would be foolish. Now, this thing is located on a pin I should have showed you at the bottom. But it also has to, because I didn't remove the two brackets at the front, it has to go there first. So it goes there, and then it goes there. And of course, you can see the bolts. You can't see, but I can see the bolts. And they're lined up to the bores they go into, and I know that's in place. When it's on the dowel, you won't be able to wiggle it side to side like this because it's located by a dowel, but that's in. While we're here, get all this done at once. 89, hi, 89 inch pounds. Um, and that's your sequence. And you would be looking at it. That is as you would look at it in the van. Uh, and there you go. All right, let's wrap it up. All right, let's wrap this turd video up. I hope you've learned how to do it. I think I showed you the idiosyncrasies. The important thing to know is that uh, 
Um, it, it, it bills, all that it bills it as a three hour job. I think that's right. I can do it in slightly less than three hours. I usually, it usually takes more because I take my time or I run into some issue. But um, if you've never done it before, it'll take you longer, but just take your time, it's just nuts and bolts. And I hope I have shown you some tricks. If you were to take the cowl piece or the oval air intake out, this whole thing would get a lot easier because then you can see in there and you can do all kinds of stuff. And and I every time I do it, something fights me. One of the injector secondary locks will fight or who the hell knows. But that is a way of things. Is there anything else to know about this? No, I don't think so. I believe we have yet to see a doorman come back. Um, uh, and why would it? It's not build it, but I mean, it's aluminum, it's beautiful, and it's and it's top quality, and it's designed specifically to solve this problem. So uh, I, I would think that of the two fatal flaws, not even fatal, just common flaws of the Pentastar, one being the Pentastar tick, the other being the oil cooler leak, this one pretty much solves the oil cooler leak, and the um, newer rocker arms pretty much, as far as we know, solve the uh, Pentastar tick. And then you've got the perfect engine. They just don't, they just go to half a million and that's what they do. All right, love you. Let's cuddle, let's touch the tips and let's, uh, let's sing show tunes together. All right, bye.